So our next speaker is one of our newer research uh, tenure track faculty, uh, Suva Roy. He'll be talking on functional mapping of early visual pathways in a new animal model for research. Uh, Suva earned his master's degree in physics, actually, at the Indian, at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. Uh, but then he did graduate work at Indiana University Blooming Bloomington and developed a strong interest in biology while studying the fly visual system. Uh, he then did some postdoctoral work, actually quite a bit of postdoctoral work at Duke and some at UCLA, where he specialized in retinal cell types, circuitry, and computations. And he's now joining us. And in terms of his, the interesting facts he told me is that in his free time, he likes to do coding and experimenting with cocktail mixes, presumably at the same time, I think. That would be the most interesting. So uh, go ahead, Suva. It's yours. Thanks, Paul, for that introduction. Uh, so there have been some fantastic talks and sort of sets the stage for what I'm about to talk about. And I want to change the perspective a little bit from you know the, the idea of diagnosing glaucoma or, a, or as a matter of fact, any other disease to understanding what goes on inside the retina, particularly with different cells and how they connect and what happens to those connections. Uh, so as I was, as I was uh, talking about, so uh, I wanna turn uh, the attention a little, a little bit toward retina and the cells that, that comprise the retina. Um, so when we think about the, the impact of a retinal disease, whether it's glaucoma or RP or AMD, uh, if you look at the response of patients when they go into a clinic, uh, the responses do not necessarily tell you about something that is immediately happening in the retina, but maybe something downstream that's happening in the brain, uh, in the visual cortex or any of the uh, subcortical areas that receive the, the, the retinal output. And so I'm gonna begin with that uh, discussion because it's important to think about the different pathways, both that are present in the retina and, and, and the pathways that uh, exist uh, outside the retina. And so uh, for the general audience, uh, when we look outside, the light enters our eye, uh, the lens focuses the image at the back of our eye onto the retina where the light gets absorbed by photoreceptors. It gets converted into electrical signals, gets processed within the retina, and is then converted into spike trains, which is then sent to different brain areas. Now, there are both pathways within the retina and pathways outside the retina. And as have been pointed out in Zach's talk and a few other talks that, you know, Degeneration can happen both within and outside, and perhaps at different points. Uh, and so for me, the interest has been uh, mostly on focused on the retina, but uh, recently I have uh, pursued sort of this uh, projection patterns from the retina to these subcortical areas and trying to sort of parse out these different pathways in the context of visual processing, as well as also for disease progression. And I'm highlighting two areas here, the LGN and the superior colliculus. These are the two main areas that receive bulk of the retinal output. Now, I'm gonna to touch on these two areas, but I'm gonna start with the retina. Of course, we know these are the major cell classes within the, uh, within the retina, and you have this beautiful structure. Uh, so my apologies to folks who are uh, you know, uh, studying the glia and astrocytes. I'll come to that, but they are also important. Uh, but if you think about the organization of the retina, these are the main uh, neuronal classes that comprise the retina, at least in terms of the uh, circuitry. And if you think about each of these classes, these classes can be described, these, these can be categorized into multiple subtypes. And there have been a lot of techniques that have been developed over the last 10, 15 years uh, to sort of parse out the different cell types belonging to a particular class. And these uh, rely on gene expression, on the structure, as well as their function. And so here is an example of a UMAP based on uh, single cell sequencing of mouse retina. And each of these clusters represent a particular type. The color represents the class. 
And you can appreciate that there are many, many types. As a, as a matter of fact, in the mouse retina, there are about 63 types of amacrine cells and about 45 types of retinal ganglion cells. And of course, on the right, you have some illustration of the different uh, structures. So, but of course, the number of cell types are not conserved across different species. And again, I'll, I'll come to that point, but it's important to think about the diversity of cell types within the retina. And it's important to think about that because different cell types are more or less vulnerable to glaucoma, especially in the onset and progression of the disease. So um, why do we care about these cell types? Well, they are specialized, they form well-defined circuits, and they perform important functions. So here are two examples. On the left, you have a pathway that has been quite extensively studied for scotopic vision. And as you can see, that there are multiple cell types that contact each other through chemical synapses, electrical synapses, and these, uh, th this entire circuit needs to work in con concert to make sure that we can uh, identify objects when the light goes down. On the other hand, when we walk into a bright room, there is an increased uh, 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 level of dopamine in our, ret in, in our retina. And again, there is a complex circuitry that's involved in how dopamine modulates the, the, the responses of individual cells. And so I'm just showing two circuits and there are many, many circuits within the retina that are involved in a variety of uh, functions uh, such as uh, detection of light to detection of motion. Now let's switch the attention to the two areas that I focused on. So these are the two major visual hubs. And these, so the, uh, the, the output of the retina are primarily directed to the LGN and the SC, so in short, the superior colliculus. The, one of the important distinction is if you look at the data from the mouse studies, as opposed to the data from the primate studies, the majority of the retinal ganglion cell output uh, in mouse goes to the superior colliculus. As a matter of fact, 80% of the retinal output are directed to the SC and 20% are directed to the LGN, unlike us, or primates, where about 70 to 80% are, are, are directed to the LGN and about 20% are directed to the SC. So it's important to think about these distinctions because when we think about uh, using a particular model system for a drug discovery or even for basic science, we need to think about translating them into a different species. And that's something that I'll come back at the very end of my talk. And so, Again, these are the two areas, but not the only two areas. There are 40 to 50 types of uh, locations in the brain where the retinal output gets directed. So I've been talking about pathways so far, and uh, there's a reason why I have been going about with pathways. Turns out that these pathways are also vulnerable in glaucoma. So for example, uh, the IPRGCs, which is in short, called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. It's kind of a unique ganglion cell because it's the only ganglion cell type that expresses opsin outside the photoreceptors. And these cells, supposedly based on mouse studies, are more uh, robust to, uh, to onslaught of glaucoma, as opposed to midget retinal ganglion cells, for example, which are less uh, resistant to glaucoma onslaught. The onslaught doesn't get limited within the retina, and studies have shown in primates that, that uh, recipient cells in the LGN also show reduced activity when there is an, you, you know, uh, 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 the, the progression of the disease occurs. And these are studies from macaques. And so both cells within the retina, as well as outside the retina, for example, the axons of the optic nerve, when they degenerate, it sort of cuts out the visual signal that, that, that communicates between the retina and to these brain areas. And one of the important questions here is to uh, think about, can, the, can, can we understand what sort of visual deficits occur by honing down on the gene expression of these cell types, or perhaps what sort of defects occur in their signaling? 
And can we reverse that question that if we have information about the gene expression and what cell types are more robust or you know, less robust to glaucoma uh, onslaught, can we use those strategies to restore vision? And one of the consortia, the Restore Consortium, actually has this initiative already going on for several years now to restore uh, uh, functions of retinal ganglion cell and as, as well as uh, 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 regenerate the axons of the optic nerve. And over time, that's one of the uh, forms of degeneration that happens in glaucoma patients. So, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide. This is sort of self-obvious to this audience that uh, in glaucoma, there is a gradual loss of vision and it starts at the outer edges of our visual field and it progresses to the center. Now, IOP is one of the major risk factors, but it's not the only risk factors because there are other forms of glaucoma that are independent of IOP. But in all forms of glaucoma, the common outcome is that retinal ganglion cells are injured and they die. And so uh, it's, a, it's a good strategy to target the retinal ganglion cells as both studying what, what forms of uh, visual deficits occur and also perhaps to find ways to restore functions in these ganglion cells. The problem is that there are not one pathway. There are hundreds of pathways. There are involvement of non-neuronal cells called support cells, Mueller gliastrocytes, uh, oligodendrocytes, as, uh, uh, microglia, all of these gets activated in different ways at different times, including the injury on the retinal ganglion cells are asynchronous, meaning depending on the time of disease progression, the axons might uh, be injured first as opposed to the dendrites. And so it's important to think about, you know, what sort of signaling mechanisms are involved. And there are many of them, for example, the TNF alpha, the rocase, the cytokine, interleukin, these are probably four or five of 50 or 60 different pathways. And studies have focused on each of these different pathways in mouse model. Uh, and so that's one of the, also the challenges of using a model because you have to figure out which is the right model and how do you choose that model? And so uh, one of the common strategies is that, okay, we want to target the retinal ganglion cells because it's a site of injury, but we also need to find a good animal model. And the two, well, the most commonly used animal model is the rodent model. Both mice and rats have been used extensively for studying glaucoma uh, uh, onset and progression. But I want to introduce the tree shrew. And for audience who are not familiar what a tree shrew is, it's a native of Southeast Asia. Uh, it is uh, currently available in a couple of uh, labs in the United States and also outside the United States. They look cute, but that's not a justification for using them. There's a better justification, which is that their visual system is optimized for daytime high resolution color vision, okay? Uh, interestingly, unlike primates, which are including us, we are still rod dominated. Although our vision is mainly cone dependent, the total number of rods still outnumber uh, cones. But in tree shrews, it's 90, 95% cones and only 5% rods. So if you're interested in studying how daytime vision changes and what sort of mechanisms might be involved in the degeneration in the retina, it's a great model for studying that. It also has an area called area centralis. It's similar to uh, fovea. It's not exactly the same. Uh, it doesn't have a macula, but it has a region. It's like visual streak that you find in dogs. But it's an area where you have a uh, uh, high density of photoreceptors and also ganglion cells with very narrow branched structure. And that's important because it sort of endows uh, central vision with a very high spatial equity. And of course, there are morphological differences between the ganglion cells in the central uh, versus the peripheral ret retina. Um, it's also a great model for studying glaucoma. And uh, some of the labs have already shown uh, uh, using microbead uh, injection in tree shrew eyes that there occurs a significant remodeling of the optic nerve head, uh, including uh, you know, uh, the changes that, that occur in the lamina cribrosa. 
Now, one of the interesting uh, points about the lamina cribrosa in tree shoes is that it's load bearing. And that's one of the important characteristics of, uh, of our uh, uh, eyes and in, 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 in particular primate vision. And so if you want to understand sort of the pathophysiology, especially at different sites within the eye, it's a great model. And there also have been studies showing axon degeneration uh, in tree shrews. Now, interestingly, there are not many labs that have actually looked at the retina of tree shrews. And the labs that have actually worked with tree shrews, their studies have been focused mo uh, mo mostly on uh, the brain, particularly the visual cortex. And so the studies that have been done so far in the primary visual cortex, V1 and V2, have shown the existence of these beautiful uh, orientation preference maps, which is sort of uh, uh, quite quintessential primate-like responses that you would observe in, in primate V1. Also, there is uh, sinusoid retinotopy in V2. They have ocular dominance columns like primates, but they're small and cheap. So, you know, there's some incentive to using them. Okay, so I hope I have at least you know, uh, gave you some confidence that it is an, uh, an an animal model that can be used for studying glaucoma. Now, what about targeting the retinal ganglion cells? Problem is we don't have any transgenic tree shrews, at least not in the US. So the approach that we have taken, it uh, it's sort of a, a, a culmination of uh, collaborations across multiple institutions and sort of, uh, using different uh, viral vector approaches that have been optimized in higher animals, including macaques. And so the approach we took was to inject one of these brain areas that receive retinal output. So we targeted the LGN and the SC. And so we targeted the LGN uh, first uh, using a retrograde viral vector uh, that, uh, that, that is designed to encode a promoter a uh, promoter, in this case, what we used, a human synapsin promoter, which is sort of a ubiquitous promoter for, uh, for, for retina. And then we added an actuator protein, uh, which in this case, it would be channel rhodopsin, but you can actually change that to a drug of interest or even a chemogenetic construct. And then we added a reporter at the very end so you can uh, sort of visualize uh, the expression of the fluorescent proteins in the cells that are transfected by the virus. And here is some examples of uh, the in vivo fluorescence fundus imaging of the retina. And you can see beautiful labeling of cells, which sort of confirms that the virus actually trans, uh, is transported back from the subcortical area into the retina and transfects the cells. And of course, we can zoom into the picture on the right. If you look at the right corner, you can see those axon tracks that lead up to that very end on the right. So, so that's where the optic nerve is. So that's also a confirmation that the axon, that the virus actually travels back from the axon and infects the cells. Okay, so now we have been able to target the cells, at least the ones that are projecting their output to the LGN. Can we measure their functions? Well, we can. We can use uh, multi-electrode array. It's one of the methods of uh, of obtaining large scale measurements of retinal ganglion cell activity. So we can take the eye out and take a, cut a small piece of retina and put it on an array with the ganglion cell in, in, in close proximity to the arrays and present a variety of visual stimuli. And these stimuli are designed to sort of selectively activate different types of retinal ganglion cells. And based on the activity patterns, we can separate out their voltage uh, waveforms and cluster them there are you know, algorithms that exist to separate out uh, these different waveforms, put them into clusters. And from that, we can map out what's called the receptive field of a cell. And it's sort of a functional representation of the visual feature selectivity of that particular cell. And it's sort of classical, either on-off or off-on receptive field, either it's on-center or off-center. Now, this receptive field is interesting because the off-surround, well, it's an on-center, but the off surround is not uniform because it's an orientation selective cell. It's not your typical alpha or uh, your uh, parasol cells in, in humans. 
And so it tells you that the functional properties of these cells also change depending on the type of the cell. And from the data, we can separate out different types of cells. And here I'm showing you, well, that seems the letters are uh, scrambled, but you get a general gist. So we have different types of cells. Uh, some are responding to very fast moving stimuli. Some are responding to slow moving stimuli. Some respond uh, to motion. I want to highlight the, uh, the cell on the right, the IPRGCs, these are, again, as I said, these are unique cells, and these are also some of the most uh, uh, robust cells in, 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 in glaucoma, especially they can withstand uh, glaucoma onset much better than the other cell types. And you can see that, that you know, if you shine light, you, you need to shine pretty bright light on these cells to evoke response. But once you shine light, these cells fire rapidly for a sustained way for quite a long period of time, which is quite distinct from any other cell within the retina, okay? And the IPRGCs, they project mainly to a different region, not the LGN or not the SC. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is involved in circadian responses. Okay. So, um, since we have been able to uh, target these cells using these viral vectors, we can also map out their structures. And this is sort of an example where you have uh, these cells that have been targeted in higher resolution. And this is actually an image that is obtained while the retina is put on the array, right? So while we are measuring the responses after the experiment, we can collect the epifluorescent image showing this beautiful labeled cell sitting on the array. And now, remember, I also mentioned that we could use the viral vector with an optogenetic uh, construct. And in this case, what we used is a red activatable channel rhodopsin. Now, the retina is intrinsically light sensitive. And so what we did was to block the inputs from the photoreceptors using a synaptic blocker. And then we shine this bright light to activate all of these cells that are expressing channel rhodopsin. And so what happens is when you shine a very bright light, uh, channel rhodopsin, it's basically a cation. Uh, it's agnostic of the type of ions that flow into the cell. But if the light is bright enough, the ion channel opens, sodium and potassium ions flow into the cell, it depolarizes the cell, and it produces a burst of spikes. But only those cells that have been targeted produce that burst of spikes, not the ones that have not been labeled, right? Because the other cells are expecting input from the photoreceptors, which are now blocked, okay? And so in this way, we can, we, we can separate out the functions of these cells that project to certain brain areas. And it, it's important because then we can target specific cells that are supposed to perform specific functions and assess their function as well as their structure. And because we can label their dendrites as well as their axons, we can also map out their structure. So one of the requirements of mapping out the structure is that you need to have the dendrites quite filled. And so we were able to achieve that. And to map out the structure, we used a sort of an AI-based uh, uh, semi-automated uh, tracing algorithm. So first, we need to do human annotation to map out the morphology. And then we use that data to train an AI model to predict what the, what the structure would be of a new cell. And here are some example cells. Uh, showing the different morphologies of cells that project to the LGN. So, so far I've given you some idea about the techniques and the way we can assess the functions and the structures of these cells, but we want to utilize these approaches for studying neurodegeneration, especially in the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, and this is something that I am uh, sort of establishing in my lab, and I have collaborations both within the Institute and outside Moran, where we are trying to sort of optimize these different techniques to be applied in both mouse, tree shrew, uh, uh, marmoset, as well as in macaque models uh, of, of neurodegeneration. So here's sort of the uh, general sort of arc where you can use the model, you can, uh, you can use viral vector-based approaches to target cells that project to a certain brain area and then induce hypertension. And there are different models you can use to induce hypertension. You can do an in vivo assessment to assess the structural and the functional deficits in the, 
in the in the in the retina and then you can look at the retina and assess if there are functional deficits within specific cell types and then you can go back and look at the brain and map out what happens to the regions where you have injected the virus but this also opens up a new opportunity because if the viral vector and again these viral vectors have to be optimized for certain animal models if you can optimize it for a model that shares its genome with us as opposed to a different species, there's a higher likelihood you can use those constructs for a gene therapy that might better translate to humans. And so one of my goals is to use tree shrews and also collaboration with Zach and Alessandra and other folks to figure out sort of these, uh, the right constructs and the right serotype, the right capsid design and the right uh, promoter to target retinal ganglion cells of certain types so we can assess their functions uh, or the functional deficits in the early stages of degeneration. And of course, use similar constructs to design gene therapy-based approaches. Now, one of the points that I want to highlight uh, is what happens to the inner retina, okay? Now, in, in diseases like RP, where photoreceptors die, uh, there occurs a lot of remodeling. And Brian Jones has done a lot of work on retinal remodeling in RP. But what happens when retinal ganglion cells die? You would imagine that you know, the presynaptic cells and the circuits should be fine, especially the photoreceptors. And that's something that I don't have an answer to, but I would like to know. So the retinal ganglion cells receive their input from presynaptic neurons, which are called interneurons. Uh, and they comprise of two major classes, the bipolar cells and the amacrine cells. And the bipolar cells and the amacrine cells, they work in concert depending on the, you know, the, the type of circuit using different types of uh, molecules such as uh, uh, GABA and, and glutamate and acetylcholine to sort of shape these specific computations at these, at these synaptic sites. So what happens if the dendrites get pruned, okay? You would expect that perhaps the bipolar cell terminals also retract. If they don't, then what happens to the dumping of glutamate when you shine light on the retina? Is there sort of a, a compensation in the inner retinal circuits as a result of pruning of the dendrites? And so uh, I have been working on also developing custom designed light sheet microscopes that could do live imaging of the retina to measure the dynamics of neurons that are presynaptic to the retinal ganglion cells at the resolution of individual uh, dendrites. And so uh, these are some of the approaches that we can use to not just study you know, what happens in the ganglion cells and in the downstream areas, but also what happens within the retina. And also more importantly, the time points uh, when those changes occur. And so uh, uh, with that, I'd like to stop and uh, acknowledge uh, folks in my lab. Uh, Franz, uh, who is my faculty advisor, and uh, uh, a number of external collaborations. And one of the things that I have been pushing is to um, develop some of these techniques that could be translated to macaques. And I have ongoing collaborations to test some of these viral vectors, uh, and specifically to test cell tropism, uh, immune responses in higher animals. And again, I see opportunities to test some of those ideas uh, in marmosets with the with with collaborations, and finally, uh, thanks to NIH for funding the work and to the audience. So happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'll introduce our next speaker, who is Caroline Garrett, who uh, earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from the Ohio State College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, we have a few other Buckeyes here. I think if you're a Buckeye, raise your hand. Do we have? No one else, they're not here right now. Dr. Petty's one, Mubarak's one. Um, and then uh, she completed a postdoctoral residency in laboratory animal medicine at Johns Hopkins and uh, recently joined our faculty. She also serves as a senior clinical veterinarian in the Office of Comparative Medicine here. Uh, her interesting fact outside of work, she's an avid indoor and outdoor rock climber. So uh, thank you and, and thank you for speaking with us. 
Great. Uh, thanks so much for the introductory, uh, Brian. Uh, I hope nobody minds. This will certainly be the most preclinical uh, lecture of the day. Um, as Brian said, I am a clinical veterinarian in the Office of Comparative Medicine, and I have been now for three years here at the U. Um, and I did just join uh, Miranda's research faculty this past July. Um, and I'm really excited to have this appointment because um, in addition to providing preclinical veterinary care and programmatic oversight to OCM, I do have my own primary research interests that date back to um, work that I began at Johns Hopkins, um, as well as um, several different uh, support efforts with researchers here at the Moran, as well as across other um, departments here at the U. Uh, so at this point, uh, the majority of clinical care I provide is to uh, larger species, namely sheep, swine, and non-human primates, specifically macaque and marmoset monkeys. Um, my typical care practices are comparable, if not analogous, to usually what standard of care would be for our human patients. Um, most of the animals um, that I oversee cost uh, thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars to purchase. Um, typically, they have lead times prior to their arrival of anywhere from six months to multiple years, as in the case of macaques. Um, typically, once they arrive, um, they have a considerable amount of investment, both on my part as well as that of the investigators in their labs, both financially and uh, time commitment wise. Um, and just to give you some examples of the types of cases that I see um, here at the U, uh, we do have a very robust colony of uh, marmoset monkeys that we already mentioned several times today. Um, these are solely bred in captivity um, and I'll introduce you to them a little bit more later. Uh, all of our marmoset research here is funded by PIs at the Moran. Um, in addition to marmosets at Johns Hopkins, we also bred owl monkeys and squirrel monkeys, as well as two different types of macaques, all for NIH funded neuroscience studies. Uh, the female owl monkey in the center is recovering from um, a C-section that was required, an emergency C-section uh, to remove a fetus that was in breach. Uh, luckily, we were able to perform the surgery and remove this fetus, but um, reproductive uh, complications are relatively common in preclinical research, uh, particularly with certain species of primates. Um, because we do have marmosets here that can live five to 10 years and macaques that can live 10 to 20 plus years, um, I do manage uh, quite a few conditions associated with old age. Um, this could be anything from um, fairly severe dental disease and arthritis uh, to various forms of neoplasia. Uh, the picture on the top right is actually about a 20-year-old pigtail macaque. These are used a lot for um, SAV, HIV research. Uh, that required a fairly extensive, but about three centimeter long uh, root canal and filling, um, following a slab fracture to his tooth, which we were able to fill. Um, despite having state-of-the-art enclosures, um, as well as a systematic process for repairing uh, lab animals, injuries are unfortunately rather common that require uh, surgical repairs. Um, the pigtail macaque on the bottom right uh, actually had a complete uh, fracture to her radius and ulna, uh, that I applied a compression plate to. Um, unfortunately, uh, because she was just a young juvenile, uh, she tolerated that type of um, casting that was required, but um, most of the time, non-human primates don't tolerate this uh, sort of thing, um, nor do they tolerate any sort of external suture material. Um, as far as gastrointestinal diseases, this could be a lecture in and of itself for me. Um, one of my primary areas of research focus at Johns Hopkins, where we had a, a colony of over 200 marmosets, was uh, both the early detection and also the chronic management of inflammatory bowel and secondary metabolic bone disease. Um, these are unfortunately um, captive marmoset phenomena that are experienced internationally. Um, we are very fortunate here um, at the U. Our colony has an extremely nat uh, low naturally occurring incidence rate, um, and this is in comparison to other institutions in the United States, as well as to colonies I visited in both um, Germany and in Japan. Uh, I heavily rely on uh, a variety of imaging and diagnostic modalities in my day-to-day -day clinical practice and also su support our research here. Um, because we do breed marmosets here, I spend a lot of time uh, performing ultrasounds, uh, not only to track fetal health, but also to uh, stage their pregnancies, uh, very similar to uh, women. 
Uh, I perform quite a bit of blood work uh, as part of my screening before I accept uh, particularly primates. Um, also as part of our uh, semi-annual exams on these primates. Uh, again, this is where the clinical investment becomes really um, time consuming. Uh, and I also use a lot of blood work uh, in combination with fecal-based markers uh, to screen marmosets for inflammatory bowel um, and also to track their digestive efficiency. And this is work that I do um, with a collaborator at the Smithsonian. Um, I've been talking a lot about primates, but I also work with several large orthopedic groups here um, who use primarily sheet models to look at osteointegration um, in various coatings over um, certain types of implants. Um, and so for these models, uh, we of course perform quite a bit of intraoperative fluoro as well as uh, longitudinal radi radiography as well as CT scans um, as re are required often for a year or more by the FDA. Uh, we are fortunate here in the U at the U in that we have uh, the ability to perform advanced imaging on everything from small rodents to very large livestock right here on campus. Uh, where I am primarily stationed in SMBB, uh, we have a uh, micro CT as well as a um, 7 TMR that we can use for rodents. And um, now we're also using uh, with our marmosets for some of Zach's work. Uh, over in Research Park at the Imaging and Neuroscience Center, we have uh, multiple 3Ts that we can use uh, for our livestock. I also use them for some of my macaque studies. Um, and this is done usually in adjacency to our human patients. Um, I greatly enjoy and spend a lot of time um, not only developing but troubleshooting models that require fairly intricate anesthesia and perioperative care. Um, some of the shorter procedures that I support might last an hour or two if it's a um, non-invasive imaging study or a minor operating procedure. Um, but the bulk majority of the procedures I support do last between four and eight hours. And this is most of our um, open abdominal and thoracic surgeries, as well as most of our non-human primate uh, cranial implants and um, cranial injections that we use to um, administer various viruses. Uh, I also support, along with the entire lab, uh, anesthetic events that can last upwards of four to five days under anesthesia. These are specifically the um, terminal marmoset neurophysiology experiments uh, that are performed by the Angelucci lab. Um, as part of designing these regimens, in addition to um, considering the animal's health status, uh, going into these surgeries and anesthesias, I spend a lot of time working with PIs uh, to identify potential study confounders that could be introduced um, through various drugs and um, techniques. Often PIs are very focused on experimental drugs and test articles, but of course, in particular with large animals, there are a lot of other drugs that we administer them that uh, can pose as research confounders, and I, I want to try to avoid those. Um, a lot of the physiologic support um, that I recommend is based not only on uh, the size of the animal, but it's also its metabolism, um, its ability to be handled uh, awake versus um, with various forms of chemical or physical restraint. Um, and also, and this is uh, actually quite important, um, I can't emphasize enough, the uh, availability of the correct uh, monitoring equipment, not only for the species, uh, but also for the model. Uh, the picture on the bottom left is one of our standard setups for uh, the marmoset multi-day terminal experiments. Um, it's a little tricky to see, but the marmoset is already in uh, stereotax. This is about a 400, 450 gram animal. Um, it's attached to a variety of different multi-monitoring equipment. Um, in addition, uh, prior to the start of the experiment, we also uh, perform a tracheotomy by a cut down to um, surgically implant a trach tube. This is in contrast to our survival procedures, which are done through just simple endotracheal intubation. Um, this is really essential when you're keeping these animals under anesthesia for multiple days uh, straight. We need to be able to really control lung mechanics and also remove any uh, moisture or condensation that accumulates in the airway. Um, in addition to that, about a year and a half ago, we also started to surgically implant two um, central um, vascular catheters as opposed to um, just day use peripheral catheters. Uh, these add on about an hour or more of time, um, but they're really essential uh, because it allows us to deliver sufentanyl as a deep sedative, um, which is imperative for these studies uh, that are looking at neurophysiology. They can't be performed under isofluorine 
And so um, these catheters are wonderful for that. Um, and they also allow us to um, deliver a paralytic, of course, because um, we have to prevent any ocular movements as well as standard maintenance fluids um, and dextrose to these animals. Um, a lot of the models I support uh, require quite a bit of longitudinal um, biological data acquisition and sample collection from awake behaving animals. Um, so um, over my tenure, I've become fairly proficient um, at implanting a variety of different telemetry units, primarily for um, cardiovascular research, as well as a lot of indwelling catheters, um, CNS catheters, and various gastrointestinal sampling ports. Um, a really refined vascular technique that I've been using a lot here at the U um, is shown in the middle. This is specifically in macaques uh, that are trained to present their legs for um, drug administration and uh, blood collection. Um, here, I use a very small incision. Again, these are macaques, and so we want to minimize the size of the incisions um, to implant a vascular access port uh, very similar to what you might use in a human um, and then advance a catheter up to uh, essentially the abdominal vena cava. And these catheters really allow us to, for, for years, um, minimally invasively collect blood and administer drugs. Um, and if they're well-maintained, they can last for multiple years. I have macaques in SMBB uh, that have been implanted now for going on three years. Um, and they also eliminate the need to uh, put macaques um, in jackets uh, that would protect exteriorized uh, catheters like uh, Hickman's or Broviac's um, or tethers that protect the catheters um, outside of the animal that connect to um, an administration unit somewhere else. And I'll give you an example in a couple of slides of how I've been using these for a current project. Uh, cranial implants, uh, this could also certainly be uh, a lecture in and of itself. Uh, the two on the far right are uh, on marmoset monkeys. These are two very different implant designs that I developed um, with some investigators at Johns Hopkins, um, specifically for auditory research. Um, but I have about a decade of experience um, implanting these both in marmosets as well as in macaques and also uh, overseeing the anesthesia and what can be the uh, fairly long uh, post-operative period for these animals, um, particularly the marmosets. The recoveries are pretty intense. Um, other types of research support I provide. Um, every now and then, I uh, do have the opportunity to work from the beginning with new investigators um, and uh, completely new models for me. Um, I've had the pleasure over the past half year or so of beginning work uh, with Suva, who um, just gave a really exciting talk on uh, his past and upcoming work with Tree Shrews. Uh, Tree Shrews, while certainly an up and coming model, particularly um, in the fields of visual neuroscience, still um, are considered uh, not a major common we use lab animal model in my industry. Um, and so in addition to really supporting Suva in his research endeavors, I've also been working with Max Planck in Florida, which at least right now will be our major tree shrew vendor supplier uh, to develop what I hope will be um, a really state-of-the-art care program here um, at the U in the Moran for the shrews. I spend a lot of time uh, working with investigators, not only to write um, IACUC, uh, Institutional Animal Care and Use uh, Protocols, uh, but also uh, writing grants. Uh, I think for me, it's helpful uh, to be involved in this stage because it really allows me to um, step back and look at uh, specific uh, research aims and objectives and figure out where I, um, as a veterinarian, um, can add clinical value and also uh, support these researchers um, as far as the experiments go. Um, I think it's also very helpful for the investigators, particularly if I'm able to help draft these protocols because I speak the regulatory language. Um, I know what the IACUC wants and I also attend IACUC meetings. And so I'm able to um, advocate for the research and certainly um, expound upon it when the committee um, has various questions. Um, I also do a lot of custom training with researchers in their labs beyond uh, the initial onboarding training with tech services. 
Um, I particularly work with grad students often uh, not only to make sure they're comfortable with uh, the model and the handling, but also with the more um, nuanced techniques that are often required um, once they have their um, specific projects that they're working on. Um, I also work a lot of labs to um, set up a lot of species specific behavior training uh, for their animals. Uh, this could be everything from um, uh, positive reinforcement training uh, to encourage animals to voluntarily enter uh, restraint devices as are shown on the bottom, uh, to more advanced uh, cognitive behavioral uh, training, specifically with macaques, um, as is needed for some of our neuroscience models. Um, I periodically also do uh, provide guidance um, and participate in discussions with researchers, uh, consulting groups, and actually also directly with the FDA, specifically on the animal study designs that are used as part of IND submissions. Uh, my, my background uh, with the FDA has mostly been um, in submission of biologics, uh, but I find that um, all of these discussions and interactions are very informative for me. Um, and each, of course, submission to the FDA is a little different, um, but they really allow me to uh, step back and better uh, advise uh, researchers in academia, not only on designing safety studies, but also designing efficacy studies that may be included in some of these um, submissions. Um, as far as larger programmatic oversight, uh, in 2021, I uh, took over uh, and restructured uh, the use non-human primate environmental enrichment and behavior program. Um, not only is this required under federal law, uh, but it's really important because what it it, it does is it requires that every non-human primate used in research have a behavior assessment and an institution determined frequency. And these behavior assessments are very different um, from clinical exams. And um, the point of the program is to be able to assess the behaviors and then in turn, um, if their psychological well-being or related needs aren't being met, um, to make the changes for the individual animals um, to promote their ability to stay on study. Um, primates, in particular macaques, um, when kept in captivity, can develop a variety of atypical behaviors um, and stereotypies that, um, if not addressed um, in the proper fashion, uh, can result in having to remove these animals from study. And again, these are the animals that cost tens of thousands of dollars and at various times um, take years to actually acquire. So it's really critical um, that they remain in good health, um, both clinically as well as um, with their behavior. Uh, for those of you who uh, weren't at my seminar talk last November, um, I'll introduce you now to our colony of marmosets here at the U. Um, this is an extremely valuable resource that um, I have uh, the pleasure of not only taking care of clinically um, and heavily supporting the researchers who use these animals, um, but I also manage the uh, breeding and um, genetic diversity program for them here at the U. Uh, our colony is over 20 years old now. Um, I'm currently propagating four genetically distinct lines of animals. Um, since I've been here, our colony has near tripled in size for now um, more of a medium to large size colony. Um, both our average breeder and offspring age is relatively young, which is uh, really excellent. And of course, our research objectives are uh, to study both visual cortex anatomy and neurophysiology uh, alone and also in combination with um, awake visual behavior. And of course, to continue to develop ocular disease models specific to the marmoset um, that are translatable um, with a heavy focus on glaucoma. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to share um, some of the collaborations that I've began over the past year. Um, in addition to starting work with Zach Davis and his lab here in the Moran, I've also started two new studies um, with existing colleagues in other departments, Jan Kubinek in BME and Dustin Williams in orthopedics. Um, as far as marmoset uh, work goes, Zach and I have quite a bit of uh, complementary and overlapping experience using marmosets uh, for both uh, wake behavior as well as uh, long uh, neurophysiology studies. Um, I've been working closely with his lab over the past year to get two um, iCook protocols up and running, 
Um, and we're currently piloting a lot of the techniques in animals uh, that we'll be using uh, in the early uh, parts of next year to start his glaucoma, neural imaging, and cranial implant-based work. Uh, I've been working with Jan uh, for several years now uh, to study the deep brain neuromodulatory potential of uh, non-invasive transcortical focus guided ultrasound, uh, specifically in macaques, although Jan also has um, ongoing trials in humans using this modality. Um, a particular project that I'm working on with one of his grad students right now um, is specifically focused on uh, use of transcortical ultrasound uh, in the application of disorders of consciousness. Uh, so for these studies, um, we have chair trained macaques uh, to present their legs. Um, and I've surgically implanted the vascular access ports that I mentioned earlier in the legs. Um, and these allow me to be able to um, infuse um, a sedative, in this case, propofol um, as a constant rate infusion. Um, which effectively renders these animals unconscious. Um, and once they're unconscious, we're able to apply transcortical ultrasound, specifically targeting uh, the central thalamus. And we're able to, in essence, evaluate um, whether once this um, modality is applied, uh, if we're able to see increases in levels of consciousness as measured not only by EEG, uh, but also as measured by facial awakening behaviors. Um, of course, this model um, is chemically inducing a state of unconsciousness, uh, but the uh, application in humans, uh, of course, depending on um, the underlying etiology, uh, would be for patients that are in a coma, vegetative, or minimally unconscious states. Um, and lastly, I've been working on a relatively new project with Dustin and his group, uh, essentially a long bone, dual bone cap. Uh, the clinical indication here would be uh, for patients with below the knee amputations. Um, a lot of these patients, unfortunately, develop uh, heterotopic ossification um, and bony spurs um, proximal to the amputation site, distal to it as well. Uh, and this can actually affect overlying soft tissue, um, increase morbidity and mortality, almost like a, a compression wound. Uh, and uh, preclude these patients from um, being candidates for prosthetics over time. And so what Dustin's group has developed is a dual bone bone cap uh, that would essentially sit in the medullary canal um, of the long bone and prevent um, this type of pathology from uh, developing. And in turn for them, um, what I have developed <laughs> is a uh, sheep and a swine model uh, both to evaluate uh, placement of these devices over time um, with the hopes of uh, either reducing or preventing this type of pathology from occurring. And with that, I will take any questions. All right. Um, our final speaker today is Andrew Clark on the optogen optogenetic dissection of neural circuits Please. in the primate visual cortex. He got his mat, um, mat bachelor's degree at Miami University and his PhD at University of Chicago, uh, where, where he studied circuit mechanisms and direction sensitivity in the macaque visual cortex. Uh, he did some postdoctoral work and then left the bench to become editor of Reviews Journal Trends in Neurosciences. But he's come back to the lab and now is part of uh, Al Alessandra Angelucci's uh, large group here studying all of these various primate uh, mechanisms. And uh, he's been a research assistant professor here since just last year, 2023. For his interesting fact, he's fixing up a motorcycle sidecar rig for road trips next summer. <laughs> so go for it. Okay, thank you Paul for that introduction. <clears throat> Excuse me, so uh, I think I'm quite a bit of an outlier here today. Um, all the talks have been really excellent. Um, and everything's obviously been focused towards a translational or explicitly people aim. And um, I'm just a basic vision scientist, right? So I'm interested in the basic neurobiology of vision. Um, but I, I hope um, that I can convince you that some of the work that um, I've been privileged to be a part of here uh, and uh, in my previous life um, could have uh, utility to those uh, exploring translational um, projects. And I think that the, um, the obvious application, given that I'm interested in how um, cortical neurons input wiring generates their visual feature selectivity would be in the development of a cortical visual prosthesis. So although I'm not interested 
uh, in pursuing this work at this time itself, there are many groups uh, using primate models and also doing uh, work in humans um, in which um, subjects to patients who've been rendered uh, blind due to some retinal injury or insult um, are implanted with an electrode array like the Utah electrode array in this nice recent paper from Eduardo Fernandez's lab um, in visual cortex. And then the idea is that through electrical molecular simulation in a particular site on the array, we can restore some sort of rudimentary visual perception. Um, and in this paper and those preceding it, um, there was some success with this approach, um, but there was, there's also uh, a lot of obstacles that remain. Um, and uh, some of the interesting facets of this data set um, that hit to those obstacles were pointed out in a nice preview um, by some other groups that are working in this field. And um, just really briefly, that is that um, when Fernandez and colleagues uh, simulated at nearby sites uh, along a column within the Utah array, given the known retinotopic organization of visual cortex, we'd expect uh, an induced fox beam where uh, the color of the circle here represents stimulation at the, the Utah array site, that it, it should be orderly uh, and sort of neighborly in visual space but that didn't seem to be the case. Um, sometimes when they simulated particular shapes in the visual cortex, um, they were labeled to elicit percepts that roughly corresponded uh, to the simulation patterns. And then other times uh, there was sort of a strange perception that didn't really correspond um, to the simulated pattern. Or if they tried to simulate a particular pattern, there was sort of an unknown uh, percept if one was even generated. Uh, so Bosheim and colleagues argued um, that potential improvements were necessary uh, to this technology before it ever becomes clinically viable. And uh, the three areas that they highlighted um, that might present the most promising avenues were um, moving from electrical microstimulation to optogenetic manipulation of neural activity. Um, and then we need to under better understand the relationship between neural activity and perception in the first place and understand the cortical circuitry that generates visual facial selectivity. So I wanna talk about um, really quickly some published work um, that uh, I've been a part of uh, for a large collaborative effort. That first um, sort of avenue that they suggested developing better optogenetic methods for studying uh, these primate cortical circuits and ultimately hopefully using them to stimulate uh, circuits in, in primate uh, models or humans in the distant future. Um, and then trying to link cortical circuits to perception. So what areas might we want to simulate to recreate, you know, certain types of visual sensations? And then finally, uh, some unpublished work that is just ongoing right now um, that we've submitted a grant for, looking at using optogenetics to dissect the cortical circuits uh, that maybe generate um, this cortical activity linked to perception. Um, so I Suva gave a really nice overview of optogenetics. I'm not going to you know, belabor the point. Uh, the tool's been around for about 20 years now, but it's basically at heart just using uh, light-sensitive proteins um, transfected through different molecular genetic means into uh, different neuronal populations to either excite or inhibit neuronal activity, right? So in classical electrical microstimulation, uh, an electrode or electrode array is introduced into cortex, and we can apply a small electrical current that activates volt native voltage-gated sodium channels. Um, and it's gonna uh, activate the neurons, just a heterogeneous population of neurons around the electrode tip. So optogenetics offers two um, improvements over these more classical methods. One is we have bi-directional control. We can use different opsins like uh, halo red opsin to inhibit or channel red opsin to excite based on the ionic species that they flux. And then the cell type specificity. So based on uh, either um, our viral strategy or in mouse models with germline strategy, we can selectively transfect, say, either excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons to study the actual role of these cell types in the circuit. Um, but in the primate so far, uh, there's been a couple of problems that are sort of unique to these species. Uh, and that is that um, the brain is just so much larger, right? So one surface photostimulation, which is the a typical method for activating um, these opsins, uh, can't reach deep layers of the primate cortex. So we can turn up light intensity, but then that just generates heat artifacts from increases in irradiant heating. Uh, and then the other problem is that primate cortical areas have volumes on the order of uh, cubic centimeters. So if we would use a single penetrating fiber, uh, it provides insufficient coverage. Um, 
to activate the tissue on a scale likely necessary to, to exert some effect. So to try to overcome these, uh, these problems, um, Alessandra's group in collaboration with Steve Blair here at the U and some engineering labs uh, in the UK and in uh, West Virginia have developed the Utah Optrode Array, genetic analog to the Utah Electrode Array. It has the sort of the same uh, design, the same total area and pitch, um, but instead of introducing electrical current or recording electrical signals from the cortex, we can introduce light selectively. So it consists of three basic components, uh, a custom micro LED array that serves as the source, uh, and that's bonded to an optical interposer to shield stray surface illumination. And then that's bonded to a glass needle array. Um, and we can um, vary the, uh, the, the length of these, these needles as well as various features uh, of the shank, like, like diameter and tip profile. Um, and, and with it, we can introduce sort of different spatial and temporal patterns of light into the cortex to activate these opsins, hopefully to generate realistic patterns of neuronal activity. Um, so the first thing that we needed to do um, in uh, benchmarking the device uh, for use in primates was to optimize the optical performance. And there's sort of three standards that we had to meet. Um, we needed to exceed opsin activation thresholds first. So the Chenoward opsin, sort of the workhorse classical uh, depolarizing opsin in the field, uh, has uh, an activation threshold of around one milliwatt per millimeter squared. Um, so this is just a picture of the, the array emerged in a fluorescent solution so that we could image light output and then um, model its spread and intensity. And then the green lines here just show um, the regions under which um, uh, irradiance exceeded that one milliwatt per millimeter squared threshold, right? So we can, um, we can introduce light of sufficient intensity uh, at the, the needle tip. Um, and we can also ensure that it's only at the needle tip with the, that we introduce it. So an early version of the array um, didn't incorporate this interposer layer. It just used a pinhole at the, back, the sort of back plane or base plate of the needle array. Uh, and that introduced, you can see here, um, surface illumination artifacts. So if we wanted to study some um, neurophysiological phenomenon that we thought was isolated to deep layers, and we wanted to only introduce stimulation into deep layers, then had we been using a device like this, we would have actually been stimulating multiple layers of the cortex. So the interposers uh, efficiently blocks that light. And then we can introduce a thermal uh, annealing process um, after the array is complete to change the needle tip shape. And we found that this changes the spread of light. So um, if investigators want to optimize an array in terms of uh, length or spread of light in the cortex, we can do that. Um, so this suggests that it could be useful as an optogenetic tool, um, but it remained to be tested. So we moved to validation in a macaque monkey model. We um, expressed channel rhodopsin just using a standard uh, AAV viral vector in macaque V1 and excitatory neurons. It was under the control of a CAMK2 promoter. Um, and then we placed the UOA uh, in a region of uh, channel rhodopsin expression, which we could image in vivo um, it's hard to see in this image, but we could confirm it po uh, through postmortem histology um, in the region where, we, where the cells are expressing channel rhodopsin. Um, we we uh, insert the UOA into cortex the same way that the Utah electrode array is inserted um, with a pneumatic inserter device, and that put the shank tips around layer 4C. And then we made uh, electrical recordings at nearby sites. Here you can see a guide tube that contains a linear electrode array. Um, so just uh, a linear uh, array of electrode recording contacts was introduced into the cortex uh, directly adjacent to the UOA. Um, and we could compare those recordings uh, with that same LEA in uh, channel rhodopsin transfected cortex in which we're now stimulating V1 with surface stimulation. So in the case of the UOA, this is just a little cartoon schematic that illustrates the experimental preparation. We have the the main layers of cortex, the superficial layer, uh, layer 4C, the thalamic input layer, and the deep layers. Um, and then we have uh, the UOA with tips roughly in 4C and then stimulation or recording throughout the cortical depth. So if we look at neuronal spiking and multi-unit activity uh, across the recording context, so each trace is just the firing rate uh, as a function of time uh, in a one second trial when we're, we're pulsing the UOA at five Hertz, you can see that there's an elevated um, activation around layer 4C. 
uh, and in the deeper layers and a little bit of the superficial layers. So we can do a, what's called a current source density analysis, which is just an analytical technique that lets us try to identify um, the location of hyperpolarizing and deep depolarizing current flow in the cortex based on the pattern of local field potential across the cortex. And that's what's shown here. So the only thing that you need to take away from that is that sinks represent depolarizing uh, current flow and that's sort of localized in time and space um, to layer 4C, at least initially before spreading to other layers. So this is in contrast to if we just repeat this experiment um, using surface through stimulation. So here we're recording throughout the cortical layers, but now instead of the UOA delivering light to deep layers, um, we have a collimated optical fiber above the cortex that's just shining light onto the tissue. And in this case, you can see that there's spiking in the superficial layers that extends to about layer 4C and that the current uh, sinks are localized to those layers and the earliest occur in the superficial layers because that's where light is penetrating. C. So we could turn this light up, um, but we would likely cause spiking just based on the increase in heat. So this demonstrates that we have selective optogenetic access to deep layers, but what we really want is to activate distinct networks. So um, we, to test that, we stimulated uh, in a range of different experiments, just at different individual sites on the UEA, uh, UOA, sort of like that um, UEA stimulation pattern in the, the cortical prosthesis trial of Fernandez et al. So this is just a case where we were recording um, distant from the, from the UOA array um, throughout the cortical depth. This is sort of a bird's eye view. And then we stimulate here in, in row four of the nearest column to the array. And this is the, the evoked potential. So just the, the low pass filtered um, trial averaged uh, local field potential. You can see um, that the earliest deflection occurs in the middle layers and that the polarity flips. Um, and when we do a CSD analysis of that, it reveals a, a current sink that's localized to those middle layers. So we can repeat this experiment, but now we can just change the site of UOA stimulation. And when we do that, um, we can then do a principal components analysis of the current source density. Um, and that revealed that there were th the three distinct clusters. So this just identifies the dimensions um, that explain most of the variance in this uh, high dimensional space. Um, and if we go back and look at those clusters, the data points that represent those clusters that are just projected on the first two principal components here, um, we see that they map really nicely in a correlation matrix onto the, the location where we stimulate it. So this is just the cluster, and then this represents the row of stimulation in that first column. So you can see that almost all the data points in cluster three were generated by stimulation um, at row three and so on. Um, so this lets us know that when we stimulate at different locations in the UOA, we're activating different V1 networks. But um, since it's sort of an unbiased analytical technique just to identify patterns in the data, um, we don't know what the actual like interpretable neurophysiological parameters um, of that stimulation are. And to uh, analyze that, we, we turned to latency, response onset latency, and found that, that that's probably what's um, coming out in the PCA that can be used to distinguish activated networks. So. Again, we're just recording throughout the cortical depth at a sites nearby the UOA, and now we're stimulating um, in row eight uh, at the, the, the closest column to the array. And if we just look at the activity, at the, the multi-unit activity on two example contacts, one in layer 4C and one in the deep layers in layer six, uh, you can see that uh, following stimulation uh, time zero, um, we see an increase in neuronal activity, but uh, it's larger in amplitude and much earlier in onset in layer 4C. Um, and this is consistent across multiple uh, repetitions of the experiment, which is just shown in the histogram. So the shortest latencies were in layer 4C consistently, uh, which is, makes sense because that's where the shank tips were. Uh, and this means that the deeper layer responses were likely driven by multisynaptic activation. So if we um, repeat this experiment, but now um, if we move our recording site to areas that remain nearby the probe, we found um, there was this sort of nice linear relationship in onset latency uh, as we move in distance across the recording array. And then just moving uh, stimulation locations just sort of generated a, a, an offset in that function. It didn't change the slope. But now if we move farther away, we again get that offset, but the slope differs across the two conditions, which suggests that we're stimu stimulating 
in this case, local networks, in this case, more long range networks. Um, so we also did a lot of um, uh, analysis of spatially specific stimulation to try to determine whether we can stimulate, say, single cortical columns, which would be uh, necessary for some kind of future clinical application. But just in the interest of time, um, I'm just gonna, gonna leave it there. Um, so in conclusion, the UOA can be used for precise optogenetic modulation in non-human primates. So it, it could serve as a device that maybe meets that first criteria that Beauchamp had all suggested for advancing research in cortical visual prosthetics. Um, there's a number of future developments um, in the pipeline, um, pending funding for improving the device. Um, it would be nice to uh, optimize these interstitial stimulation sites so we can have surface and deep stimulation within the same preparation, uh, to use multicolor stimulation to excite different populations of cells or to excite and inhibit the same population. And then finally, we, it'd be nice to do simultaneous photostimulation and recording. So if we could dope these uh, shanks in a transparent electrically conductive material. Um, so once we have the full UOA though, the problem still um, exists that we need to know where to place it, right? To generate some kind of uh, a naturalistic visual perception. And um, I know this is, um, this is obvious, but uh, it's important to remember that visual perception is more than just retinal process. So um, uh, illusions like the face-face illusion um, can remind us that perception of a retinal image can spontaneously alternate, right, between two different interpretations. So the cortex um, and the later visual pathways are generating an active interpretation of the constant retinal input. Um, and then this rotating snakes illusion illustrates that um, our visually guided behavior also influences perception. So if typically if we make saccades between different points within the, um, the image, uh, most people exhibit a robust perception of rotational motion, even though it's a static image. Um, and that uh, illustrates that the visual system has dedicated circuits for extracting uh, information about motion, right? Um, that we don't actually need uh, movement in the world to generate uh, subjective perception of, of visual motion. And motion is a, is a really interesting, I think, and potentially useful stimulus, um, maybe even for early visual cortical prostheses, because it can be used to extract information about other aspects of the visual scene besides object location over time. Like we can segment the visual scene, um, which we'll see in just a minute. But it's interesting that there are motion sensitive cells at multiple stages of the visual pathways. So this is just a lateral view of the macaque brain um, with some sulci exploded here to show the areas in which investigators over many decades have found cells that are tuned for different properties of visual motion within the receptive field. That is they elevate their firing rate in response to motion um, of different directions or speeds. Um, and in addition uh, to being selective for motion, though, they analyze the visual scene over different uh, scales, right? So we know that V1, the, this is the, the receptive field. Again, like uh, Suva introduced, this is the area of the retina uh, over which the, the neuron is uh, activated by visual stimulus. Um, and this, this uh, parameter increases as we move up the visual pathway from V1 to V2, V3 to, to area MT. And this is actually a problem in terms of analyzing visual motion. So it's been known for a long time that if we analyze motion with high resolution, uh, we're faced with this problem that's termed the aperture problem. And it's in its simplest form, it just says that uh, the motion of an extended contour when viewed over a very limited region, like a small aperture such as a V1 receptive field, can only be perceived uh, orthogonal to its orientation. So we can have three very different object motions uh, that result in the same um, local or aperture motion. So it's been proposed uh, that the reason that there's this redundancy is that the visual system first needs to do sort of a high resolution estimation of motion, but then it needs to integrate these signals in a way that can uh, recover information about true object motion. And it's been thought that this occurs in the V1 to MT pathway. So other investigators in the path, past have asked, do MT neurons solve the aperture problem? Uh, and to do that, um, I just hopefully really quickly want to go through a sort of classic experiment. It's been repeated uh, in many labs in, in mouse, uh, ferret, marmoset, and macaque, and they've all sort of found the same pattern of results. And that's um, what this 
it's termed this pattern component tuning experiment. So we can record from a, a neuron in the, in the visual cortex. So its receptive field will be shown here, say like in, if we're recording from MT, and we can show it two types of stimuli, either a drifting sine wave grating or a plaid pattern formed from superposition of two sine wave gratings uh, drifting in different directions. Um, and we can do this across trials uh, to generate you know, motion around the clock for the single grating and for the plaid pattern. So um, it's been hypothesized that if a neuron solves the aperture problem, it's tuning to these two types of stimuli should be identical. So here, these are hypothetical um, direction tuning curves. And this is just a polar plot where um, the angle would be a, the direction of stimulus motion and the magnitude of the vector would be the cell's response. So this would be a cell that would prefer leftward motion regardless of whether it's signaled by a single sign grating or by a plaid formed from superposition of two sign gratings. In the case of a component cell that does not solve the aperture problem, its response to single grating should be unimodal because there's a single direction of motion in the stimulus, but its response to plaid should be bimodal because one direction of pattern motion will actually generate one of the components in the cell's preferred direction. Um, and when investigators do this experiment, they find these two classes of cells in visual cortex. So these are just example component cells in which the angle between the two gratings represented above has been increased from zero to 150 degrees. And you can see that it becomes increasingly bimodal. So this is firing rate versus direction. And then this is a typical pattern cell where it's a unimodal direction tuning curve regardless of the angle uh, separating the two plaid components. And the other sort of consistent result is that there's a functional hierarchy in the distribution of these cells. So early in visual cortex, we find uh, few, if any, uh, pattern cells. So this space um, is just um, a sort of an index computed from a partial cor correlation analysis of the cell's actual tuning curves with these idealized predictions constructed from its tuning to single gratings. Um, and it, I guess the, the only important feature of this plot to take away from this is that those cells in this sort of upper left quadrant are statistically significantly classified as pattern, and those here as component, and those here are just sort of unclassified, right? So it's, it's a continuum, but it seems to shift as we move from V1 to MT. So we find few, if any, pattern cells in V1, but we find about uh, a quarter to a third in MT. Um, and what we were interested in is whether there was a functional, in addition to this functional hierarchy, whether there's a relationship to perception? Is, is there a reason that the visual system seems to be extracting this signal? Um, and to study that, we constructed a, a different type of plaid um, based on superposition of square wave gratings in which we had introduced um, a, a new sort of segmentation here. So in this, this stimulus, again, each grating, component grating can move in its own direction. Um, but now we've in, introduced sort of a random dot texturing cue to the light bar phase of every grating. Um, we can vary the contrast of that cue and we can also vary oops, the direction that it drifts on any trial. It can move in the pattern direction, or it can move in the direction of the component grading on which it's superimposed. So when we do that, um, we should generate two very different sort of qualitative states of perception. As the pattern drifts, we're gonna sort of lower the contrast of that cue. I assume everyone's seeing a single plaid pattern moving in a single co coherently in a direction one direction. And then as we lower that cue and then remove it and then start to drift it in, in those component directions, now we see something very different, right? Um, we should see two surfaces, one transparently overlaid uh, across the other. So this is sort of, uh, this is a bistable stimulus. Um, and that's what we need to study the relationship between neural activity and perception. If we um, record the spiking activity of cells where we're changing the visual stimulus in every trial, we can learn what those cells are telling us about differences uh, in the visual stimulus. But we want to know for a constant visual stimulus that can be variably perceived, um, how does differences in neural activity relate to that perception? So to do that, we train macaque monkeys uh, to do some psychophysics. So on every trial, the monkey just fixates a point. We're recording from an MT neuron, its receptive field shown here. We can introduce these patterns uh, on trials where uh, the pattern direction change is either upwards or downwards on any given trial, and we can change the sign and strength of that texture cue. So when the pattern is extinguished, the monkey learns it has to make a choice. It can make a saccade to a, a, a target on the top of the visual display to indicate it saw coherent motion or to the bottom to indicate it saw transparent motion. Um, and uh, after a fair bit of training, 
um, we found that monkeys can use these texturing cues to segment uh, the plaid motion stimulus. So here I'm plotting psychometric uh, functions from the two animals. Um, this is the probability that the monkey's going to say that pattern was coherent motion versus uh, the sign and strength of the texture cue. So just coherent patterns are randomly assigned positive values and transparent randomly assigned negative values. Um, and from these functions, we can extract a couple of different parameters, right? We can um, find out how much texture contrast generated a 50-50 split, the point of subjective quality. And then we can also figure out um, how much contrast the monkey needed to achieve a threshold level of performance. So um, uh, it was, uh, monkeys were very efficient at the task. They didn't need that much of a texture cue to reliably uh, discriminate the two types of patterns. So they can report their subjective perception of plan motion. And then we were interested whether MT neurons can also do the same thing. So this is an example cell. This is a direction tuning curve, like a real direction tuning curve, like the idealized ones I showed before, but just in response to a single grading. Um, so this cell uh, is responsive to motion up and to the left. And now when we look at its responses uh, to plaids, either drifting upwards or downwards, uh, we can plot the cell's response, its uh, firing rate, as a function again of that sine Q contrast. And we can see that it's sort of monotonically related um, to the sign and strength of that texture cue, but it differs according to the direction of pattern motion. So this neuron with single gratings really doesn't respond to downward motion. And it's, so it shows very little response to plaids drifting in a downward direction and very little difference according to texture cue. But it responds well to upward motion and it, it shows a large difference when we vary the sign and direction of that texture cue. So we can do a receiver operating characteristic analysis, uh, just like Sophia talked about earlier, where now the ideal observer model is just fed the spikes from each cell, and it tries to predict what stimulus was presented on a given trial. So model performance can be plotted as a portion of the, the times the model would say uh, the neuron's preferred stimulus was presented versus that sign Q contrast. So when um, we drifted platterns upward, um, uh, it, very little contrast is required for the model to accurately discriminate the two types of patterns um, versus when we drifted downwards, it was much poorer for performance. It took almost 100% contrast. So across the population, um, we found that the sensitivity behaved in very similar ways to this example cell. So it was stimulus dependent and the most sensitive cells um, were as sensitive or more sensitive than the observers. So there's information in MT that could account for the animal's perceptual performance on the task. But we want to know, do those responses actually correlate with perception? So this is, again, that example cell. And now, instead of sorting uh, trials according to the sign of the texture cue, the stimulus is the same on every trial. But the monkey sometimes answered transparent and sometimes coherent. All patterns were drifting upwards, and they all had the same texture cue. So whenever the monkey answered transparent, uh, the neuron tended to fire more. And um, we can do that receiver operating characteristic analysis again for this type of data. Uh, and this generates what's called a choice probability. What's the probability we could predict the monkey's choice on a given trial, just given that one MT neuron? Um, and across the sample of cells we recorded from, um, it, was, it was higher than chance. It was small but significant. Um, there was a significant correlation between MT spiking and perceptual segmentation. And again, those most sensitive neurons um, had higher, tended to have higher choice probabilities. You can see there's a fairly large or broad distribution. So we wondered uh, what cells those were. So we did a pattern component classification of our cells. Uh, in separate trials, we did that sign grading, sign plaid uh, test, and then used the partial correlation analysis to sort of parcelate the population. This is for the two different monkeys. You can see we found a large fraction of pattern cells because we're in MT, but we also found unclassified and component cells. Um, and then if we looked at the correlation between uh, choice probability and pattern index, where more positive values indicate greater pattern signaling behavior, we found a significant partial correlation in both animals. Uh, so this indicates that, um, that uh, the pattern cells, the preferred stimulus motions, coincident with stimulus motion showed the greatest reception, uh, relationship to choice. So the animal's perception could be based off of these cells. Um, so we found that monkeys can report the perceptual segmentation judgments. Um, we found empty responses to these bistable plaid stimuli depend on relative directions of stimulus motion, which makes sense since we know MT is coding visual motion. And then we found this correlation between MT activity and perceptual segmentation that was greatest 
in this uh, functionally defined relation uh, pattern population of cells that first appears in MT. Um, so what I'd like to do now is try to understand what are the cortical circuits that generate that continuum um, in MT. So what what is or the the uh, cortical cortical and intracortical uh, circuitry that generates um, this continuum of of selectivity and pattern motion encoding as it might play a role in perception. So for this, we've moved to marmoset models, um, and that's because uh, they're just more easily accessible for optogenetic studies. So marmoset behavior, uh, it resembles that of other primate species, the foveal, they, they make you know, similar patterns of saccades uh, and tracking eye movements. Um, their smooth brains allow for easier access for optical and electrophysiological access. Uh, and they have a similar cortical organization to other primates. So hopefully anything we learn here um, will translate. So the general framework uh, that we're employing in this case is to try to combine optogenetics and high density electrophysiology uh, to study circuits in V1, V2, and, and MT. So they're all easily accessible in the MERM set. And um, what's interesting in, in um, primates is that there are these parallel cortical cortical feed forward circuits linking them. So V1 projects directly to MT, um, but it also projects indirectly via a certain anatomical compartments in V2. Um, so to study these networks, we first need to be able to identify marmoset MT in vivo. Uh, so this is just a cartoon lateral view of the uh, marmoset brain now. We've placed our recording probe around the location of MT, but there are also these neighboring areas that respond to visual stimuli. So here, um, the recording sites on the probe are just color-coded according to depth, and we can use several different functional criteria to identify MT in vivo. So we can look at the progression of receptive fields across the recording array. So the, the retinotopy in MT is well known. Um, and we can see that there's like, if we're recording, you can see there's a smooth progression of receptive field size and position um, along this deeper part of the array. And then along the upper part of the array, represented by the cooler colors, there are receptive fields that sort of lie outside that range um, with sort of odd uh, dimensions. And these correspond to area MT and to another cortical area, likely the MD crescent. So um, MT is known to be direction selective, which I went over before, and also orientation selective. If we just look at the early initial response onset, what's termed the transient. So these plots are now raster plots. So instead of spike rate, um, uh, every line represents a trial, every dot represents a spike, um, and then different uh, trials are sorted according to stimulus direction or stimulus orientation. So you can see that in the case of deep contact, contact 14, um, we have clear direction tuning. The cell is much more selective to motion of a particular direction and, and some orientation tuning at the initial onset. Uh, and that's in contrast to contact four in which the cell just responds to a visual stimulus, but it doesn't respond differentially to this particular set of visual stimuli. So we can identify MT and then we can use a different optogenetic technique to try to manipulate uh, the activity of different projections to MT. So here, um, we're injecting a hyperpolarizing opsin, ArchT, into area V1. Uh, and then after sufficient time for trans transgene expression, we're recording neuronal activity at that V1 injection site and within an area MT at receptive field locations that overlap. So that MT site likely receives projections from the, the V1 neurons at the injection site. Um, ArchT is nice because you can actually inhibit activity at terminals, um, even though you've transfected the cell body. So we can inhibit feed forward V1 to MT projections by shining our laser right around the MT recording site. And what happens when we do that? Um, so now I'm plotting uh, spike rate uh, um, as color for st stimulus direction versus time. So this is basically just a direction tuning curve uh, smeared in time. And you can see in control trials, when we haven't um, inhibited feed forward and VN activity, there's a, an elevated rise in neuronal spiking for a particular range of stimulus directions. And that extends throughout the, the presentation of the stimulus. Now, when we inhibit feed forward V1 activity by shining our laser again in MT, um, we selectively activity. Um, and, and that decrease is, is greatest at the sort of the preferred direction. 
And that's what I'm showing down here. So this is just slices through these uh, contour maps um, at different times, either early in the response, the transient, or late in the response, the sustained portion. So here we have the control response as spikes per second versus stimulus direction. You can see there's a reduction in gain and it's greatest in the preferred direction. And then we can repeat the same experiment in area V2. Um, and when we do that, we find sort of similar, but a little bit qualitatively different results. Um, in this case, we find again a reduction early on. So again, the, the green laser is when we're inhibiting feed forward V2 input to MT. Uh, so we find a selective reduction in the neuronal spiking that's stimulus dependent. But then later in the response, there's actually a potentiation. So it's a hyperpolarizing opsin that's inhibiting a feed forward projection, but we're actually exhibiting, um, uh, we're observing elevated spiking. Um, so across a small sample that we've collected so far, um, we find um, the same sort of effects on tuning, um, uh, regardless of manipulation. So we can extract two, uh, at least two measures of the cell's tuning curve, a direction index. How well does it respond to its preferred direction versus its least preferred direction? And then bandwidth, what's the width of that tuning curve? Um, and then I'm just plotting here the, that metric uh, in the laser condition versus the control condition. You can see early in the response, the points lie below the diagonal, uh, indicating greater directional index, um, greater directional selectivity, um, uh, in the control case. So we, we've reduced the directional index itself. And then we've also reduced that tuning bandwidth. So it's sort of opposite effects. Um, and what's weird is we see that same pattern when we apply the manipulation to area V2. So based on the changes in gain, we know that we're likely um, activating distinct networks um, because we're changing spiking in different ways, but they're having similar effects um, on the way that the area is encoding the visual stimulus. So our hope is to move something like pattern component tuning um, to see whether selective manipulation of these areas can affect um, that dimension. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators for the various projects and thank you for your attention.